Hey, welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast, Suffixes and Side Effects by Body System for Technician and Nursing Pharmacology. I'm Tony Guerra, a pharmacist, and uh, I've written a couple of books, uh, Memorizing Pharmacology and Memorizing Pharmacology Mnemonics, among others. And what I wanted to do was kind of show you how to uh, use those books to internalize pharmacology and kind of uh, get better at it. And what we're going to do in this podcast is we're going to uh, go through some of the uh, stems, uh, which you know can be in the prefix position at the beginning of the uh, medication, uh, in the middle, which is an infix, uh, or at the end, uh, which is a suffix. And I just said suffixes and side effects because it's alliterative, same starting word, same you know, um, uh, same. A uh, number of syllables, all that stuff. Uh, but what I want to do uh, is go through this and, and kind of show you how to make sense of something like this. Because uh, often you will see uh, things like this where you've got, okay, mechanism of action, indication, uh, pharmacokinetics, uh, side effects, drug interactions. And it, it's just overwhelming. And what we want to do is kind of take our time and start uh, really internalizing some of these things and, and what are the things that we can do uh, to make things a little bit better for us. All right, well, let, let's start with uh, the first thing we want to do is we're going to be going by body system. Uh, and uh, it's important that you kind of internalize this GM rinse. Uh, I, it's the prime mnemonic uh, for the body systems that I use in the books. Uh, but gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, respiratory, immune, neuropsych, cardio, endocrine. Uh, and then, yeah, we get into genito, uh, genital urinary and, and you know stuff like that. But um, just for now, really a lot of everything goes into these seven pathophysiologic classes. And so what we want to do is we want to look at this and say, okay, how can I, you know, and as I'm, you know, working with this, you know, sheet, what, what can I do uh, to make it much more you know, relevant to me. Uh, so the first thing is, you know, in, in the books, there are a number of these stems and there's some really bad advice on the internet about what is a stem and what isn't. I assure you everything in the books are, are correct. Um, so for the stem we're gonna talk about today is Tidine, T-I-D-I-N-E. Um, it's not adidine, uh, which is like loratadine. That's a an H1 antagonist, so that's going to be something for your uh, allergies. And it's not een. It's not just the I-N-E. Uh, about you know, a fifth of all medications end in een. So you know, morphine, paroxetine. You know, so uh, other opioids and antidepressants end with een. So that that's not really helpful. We want something at the end that that really distinguishes the drug class. And one way to think about it is tadine is a lot like tadine. So when you tadine, uh, you are maybe going to have some stomach acid, and uh, that's how you can kind of make it relevant for yourself. So let's look at some of the drugs in the class. Famotidine, brand Pepsid, Nizatidine, brand Axid, Cimetidine, brand Tagamet. Uh, these are all H2 receptor antagonists. And then Ranitidine, which was Zantac, is, is off the market now. So when we look at these, first thing I always like to look at the brand name, see if there's anything that's kind of giving me, a, it just jumps out of me. And I see peptic and acid and pepsid. I see ax and I see the word acid with just the C changed to an X with acid. And I see antagonist, part of antagonist, antagamet. Uh, so those words kind of remind me of what, what these drugs are for if I'm looking at the brand name. And just so you know, your, your brain will do that. When you, the first thing when you hear acetaminophen, your brain says Tylenol. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to make a connection uh, in your brain uh, to connect something it already knows. So we'll go to the mechanism of action and, and we'll read something like, okay, the stomach's parietal cells will secrete stomach acid to lower the pH. And we just remember, if we did have a chemistry class, uh, the pH scale, 1 to 14. And uh, the lower it is, uh, the more acidic something is, uh, the more basic as you kind of go up towards 14. 
And histamine too, when we think of antihistamines, we're thinking, you know, kind of allergies and stuff like that, but there's more than one histamine. And histamine too binds to those receptors and they stimulate them to produce acid. But by blocking that histamine too, uh, we can now reduce the secreted stomach acid. So what's it for? Indications. Well, it makes sense, right? So we kind of want to uh, go with this you know, in intuition. We're like, all right, well, let's kind of use our intuition to figure this out. And, you know, it's for gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, and peptic ulcers, anything where acid secretion is an issue. So Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Uh, the only place Zollinger probably uh, ever got to be in the front of the, the class, you know, where you've got the Z last name. And so pharmacokinetics, uh, that might not be a familiar term to you, but uh, we're, we're just really saying, okay, well, of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, the ADME, you know, mnemonic that you use with that, uh, what are the things that are kind of important? Uh, and what's really important is someone wants relief they've got this stomach acid this burning and, and they want this to to work quickly and it's going to be a little bit faster uh, than the proton pump inhibitors uh, like omeprazole which is prilosec and esomeprazole which is nexium and i may be throwing words out there like ppis proton pump inhibitors what you know the thing about pharmacology is you, you continue to, to bring in these words from later and so what happens is, is as you kind of uh, work through it uh, those words become more and more familiar. But it's not near as fast as an antacid. So just after someone eats, uh, that works right away. Uh, the antacid, unfortunately, they'll only last for a few hours. So this is all about trade-offs. Okay? So the proton pump inhibitor uh, you know, might work longer, but it takes longer to work. Uh, the antacid, it'll work right away, but you might have to use it three or four times a day. And those are the kind of trade-offs we're looking at. Uh, side effects. So again, we're we're kind of saying, okay, well, when would I might when might I have to change a dosage or something like that? Uh, again, we remember that someone's very young. Uh, maybe their kidneys and their you know, liver aren't as developed, or someone's getting old and their uh, those kidney and liver are really more uh, starting to deteriorate. But either way, maybe we have to make a dose adjustment, and in this case, we would do it renally. But the kind of strange thing about cimetidine, and, and I'm talking about cimetidine is really the, the problem child in this uh, issue where um, famotidine, it really, you know, great, we would use that. But why do we even have to deal with cimetidine if something has many fewer you know, drug interactions? And uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, cimetidine is over the counter, so somebody can just grab it uh, and get it. Uh, so uh, the dose adjustment, it can raise the serum creatinine. Uh, it's a potent inhibitor of tubular creatinine secretion. So normally that creatinine is a, you know, that... Um, is going to be a, a marker of poor kidney function, though the patient has normal kidney function, so it's a little bit goofy that way. Uh, it can antagonize testosterone, which can lead to sexual dysfunction and gynecomastia, which is breasts in men. Uh, another drug, spironolactone or aldactone, is an aldosterone antagonist, and that can similarly cause gynecomastia. And you might say, well, I, I've never heard of spironolactone. What, what, what is that? And again, uh, I, I talk about in the book, to learn pharmacology, you have to have already taken pharmacology. And spironolactone comes from the cardio chapter. Uh, and that's why you kind of want to have this really quick kind of, uh, the, the book is only seven hours. So you just kind of this quick course you can do in a weekend, you kind of get it. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of use these uh, terms over and over again. Uh, you can have this B12 deficiency and you say, okay, well, you know, that's just another side effect to remember. How do I remember it? Well, you connect it to something else. So proton pump inhibitors also can cause this B12 deficiency. And it's really when you affect acid through the H2 blockers or through proton pump inhibitors uh, that you uh, can lead to malabsorption uh, because you have that decreased acid. Uh, drug interactions. Again, since ranitidine brand Zantac was pulled from the market, patients might see cimetidine, uh, which is brand Tagamet, as an OTC alternative. Uh, but it does have so many drug interactions with cimetidine. 
And now I'm really going to get into the weeds. And depending on where you know you are with pharmacology and what level you need to know it, uh, you may not need to know uh, the SIP enzymes and which what they affect. Uh, but what I'm what I'm going to go through here is just okay. Well, I'm going to go through some of the SIP enzymes. And what you should do is if you don't really know what drugs they affect, just find one that uh, really kind of stands out to you is more familiar. Uh, as you kind of go through this. So uh, it can inhibit the enzyme CYP1A2, and uh, that affects theophylline, uh, which is for asthma. CYP3A4, uh, so that's verapamil, a calcium channel blocker. And you, if you're watching the video, you'll notice that I have underlined part of the word. And what I try to do is always underline uh, any drug that has a stem, so that if you do see another drug, similar to it, uh, you can kind of internalize those stems and, and where they go. Uh, CYP2C19, so citalopram, which is an SSRI. Uh, and I also like to put the drug class. So, uh, you know, it's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Yes, that doesn't tell you it's an antidepressant. But again, it's just kind of getting these terms down, using them, uh, getting uh, the pharmacologic terminology as you would uh, with these. And then it'll decrease the effects of CYP2D6. Uh, so uh, in carvedilol, uh, third generation beta blocker. So again, uh, it's going to uh, inhibit uh, the enzymes. And if it inhibits enzymes, this is kind of the thing that you gotta wrap your head around. If it inhibits the enzyme that breaks down the drug, do you have more or less, right? And so you're going to have more drug because the thing that breaks down the drug is being held back. Okay, so I'll say that again. It inhibits the enzymes that break down the drug. Therefore, you have more drug, uh, which equals toxicity. Okay, so it's really important when you're looking at these you know, drug interactions. Uh, is it an inducer or is it an inhibitor? In this case, we have an inhibitor. Uh, with cimetidine, but if we have an inducer, uh, it's actually going to make the enzymes uh, work uh, quite a bit better, and it's going to make things break down even faster. So inhibitor or inducer, really important to know as we go through drug interactions. Uh, and this is something that, especially if you have a patient on a lot of medications, uh, you'll find that there is no real um, order to things. And what, what I mean by order is, so you have all the medications, and what we really want is not to put them alphabetically, uh, but to put them by this drug class. So again, the GM rinse mnemonic is grandmother's rinse kids hairs and kids hair, and it's gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, respiratory, immune, neuro, cardio, endocrine. And if you put all of the medications for a patient in that order, then you'll find it's a lot easier to catch uh, duplicates. It's a lot easier to catch mistakes and just makes it a lot easier altogether. So neuropsych, for example, uh, there's interactions with that. And what I've done here is just to continue getting our familiarity as we kind of listen to the podcast over the episodes, uh, is to just say, okay, well, what I'm gonna do is I'll, I'll just put the drug class, it's an atypical antipsychotic. So it's not really uh, one of the ones that uh, we had traditionally used. It's got an atypical um, mechanism and Aripiprazole or Abilify also has one of these stems and it's the Piprazole stem. That's a little bit goofy because uh, normally you don't see a stem within a stem. The Prazole stem is the one that you would expect for proton pump inhibitors. Uh, so again, just, you know, I don't have to memorize all of this right away. What we're trying to do is just familiarize ourselves with it. Uh, traditional antiepileptics versus newer antiepileptics. And the, the reason I know this is because in the, the books, the, the order is intentional. So we're going to put all the traditional antiepileptics together. Carbamazepine in this case, which is Tegretol. Phenytoin, which is Dilantin. Uh, and then you know, valproic acid would have been the other one. But by kind of putting those together, you know, we can kind of look at that. And then we look at the stems. So the peen for uh, carbamazepine and then the toin, T-O-I-N, for phenytoin. Uh, Parkinson's, it can affect Pramipexol, which is Mirapex ER. And uh, there's no stem there, which kind of a bummer. It just seems like there should be, um, but nothing there uh, to help us out. 
And then some of the SSRIs, citalopram, which is Celexa, escitalopram, which is Lexapro. And in the book, I go over the difference between the S and the something that doesn't have an S, that the S is the uh, sinister, or uh, left-handed uh, version of, uh, a, medic of a, a drug. So citalopram has the left and right kind of mirror images chemically, and then the acetalopram just has the left hand. Um, and sinister, you know, it's uh, Latin. Uh, they would think that somebody that is left-handed is sinister. So as someone who is right-handed but left-footed, uh, I take umbrage uh, to that. Uh, and then fluoxetine, uh, the oxetine stem, uh, that's one of those ones we have to be a little bit careful with uh, because although fluoxetine and peroxetine are both SSRIs, uh, you've got something like duloxetine, uh, which is not, uh, and atomoxetine, which is not, but I don't want to get in the weeds there. Uh, but just again, uh, underlining the stem, just to remind ourselves, fluoxetine, Prozac. Uh, cardio, so the anticoagulant warfarin will interact with uh, cimetidine uh, and that ferrin ending. Uh, so those are you know, warfarin-like anticoagulants. That's brand Coumadin. Uh, and then antihypertensives. So something like carvedilol. And what I would do is I would say, okay, let me underline this stem, D-I-L-O-L. And maybe you'd heard, well, wait a minute, I heard beta blockers were O-L-O-L -O -L or the L-O-L. Well, in this case, we're going to have some vasodilation, and we're going to have that uh, also will have that effect on the heart. Uh, so we'll you know, lower that heart rate at the same time that um, we're uh, dealing with this uh, vasodilation uh, to get rid of the vasoconstriction, which would have been a response uh, to that lowered heart rate. So again, don't want to get in the weeds, but uh, that's a beta blocker. We want to make sure that, okay, uh, by looking at that kind of combined ending, uh, I recognize it's not only a beta blocker, but uh, maybe I am at the level where I'm like, oh, that's third generation beta blocker, uh, where it's going to have that kind of mixed effect. Uh, Verapamil, so the PAMIL ending, P-A-M-I-L, uh, that one again tells us it is a uh, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. It's going to be one that also serves as antiarrhythmic. Uh, it's going to affect the heart. Uh, and then uh, talking about the antiarrhythmic and meodorone, uh, this would have a bit of uh, risk of QTC prolongation. So again, really a concern uh, if we have a patient on both medications uh, with cimetidine. And then, you know, kind of sticking with that, kind of organizing everything into the GM rinse way, uh, we want to have endocrine. So we'll look at some of the anti-diabetics and we say, okay, well, what would happen uh, if I now have too much metformin because uh, this drug didn't get break, uh, broken down because it, those enzymes got affected. Oh, would I have hyper or hypoglycemia? All right, well, if I have a drug that is meant to lower blood sugar and I have more of that drug around, I'm going to have hypoglycemia. Okay, and the same thing is true with glipizide, uh, sulfonylurea. Uh, but with glipizide is really, really more of a concern as we're, we're kind of looking at that hypoglycemia. So again, the, the goal wasn't to you know, kind of overwhelm you with this. But the goal is to say, okay, well, we have a stem, Tadine. Uh, we recognize that okay, it's an H2 blocker, and we have famotidine, nizatidine, cimetidine. We can learn three drugs all at once, and we can start learning the language of pharmacology as we go through this. So again, if you want to keep up with me uh, on this podcast, I certainly appreciate it. And, you know, do pick up uh, Memorizing Pharmacology and Memorizing Pharmacology Mnemonics. Uh, there's an audio version, there's a ebook version, there's, you know, print book version. My wife loves, loves uh, watching things on her Kindle, uh, where I always have things, you know, on my run or at the gym or whatever uh, in my ear. I always have an audio book uh, myself. And I think Audible has a way that you can uh, get it for free. Uh, would they have that trial or whatever. So again, hopefully you've enjoyed this uh, first episode of the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast, Suffixes and Side Effects by Body System for Technician and Nursing Pharmacology.